Tonight, Facebook apologizes, sort of. Cyberbullying is free speech in New York. And why Facebook bought Live Rail. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 121 for Wednesday, July 2nd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by SmartThings, the easiest and most affordable way to create a smart home. Protect and control your home from anywhere with no contracts or monthly fees. For 10% off any home security kit, visit smartthings.com slash twit and use the code twit10 at checkout. Hello, I'm Sarah Lane and let's get right into the tech feed. Yesterday, we talked about Facebook's psychological research experiment on nearly 700,000 unknowing users. Today, while traveling in Delhi, India, Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg said in a statement, this was part of ongoing research companies do to test different products. And that's what it was. It was poorly communicated. This was the first public comment on the study by any Facebook executive since the controversy came to light over the weekend. Sandberg also said, quote, we take privacy and security at Facebook really seriously because that is something that allows people to share opinions and emotions. I'll say. Well, this one's a bit of a head scratcher. New York State's highest court in Albany has struck down an existing anti-cyberbullying law that was enacted in 2010. The New York Court of Appeals ruled that the law violated the First Amendment in a 5-2 to two ruling yesterday. So what does the ruling mean? Well, that virtual harassment, intimidation, and the like are now protected free speech. So cyberbullying, according to New York law, specifically means... Any act of communicating by mechanical or electronic means, including posting statements on the internet or through a computer or email network, disseminating embarrassing or sexually explicit photographs, disseminating private, personal, false, or sexual information, or sending hate mail with no legitimate private, personal, or public purpose with the intent to harass, annoy, threaten, abuse, taunt, intimidate, torment, humiliate, or otherwise inflict significant emotional harm on another person. Wow, awesome. Great day in New York today. The Guardian reports that it received automated notification that six of its own articles have been scrubbed from search results as the result of a European court ruling that individuals have the right to remove material about themselves from search results, which is also known as the right to be forgotten. So when you Google someone from within the EU, you now see the most important information that the target of your search is not wanting to hide. As an example, The Guardian notes that three of the articles that date back to 2010 relate to a now retired Scottish Premier League referee named Doogie McDonald. I actually just learned that he existed, but he was found to have lied about his reasons for granting a penalty in a soccer match or football match, depending on where you live, which eventually led to his resignation. Now, anybody entering the search term Doogie McDonald Guardian into Google.com, the U.S. version of Google, will still see those three Guardian articles about the incident as their first results. In the U.K., you can still find a Doogie McDonald page. I have a hard time with that name. If you search for something like Scottish ref who lied, for example, but it disappears when you add his name to the search. The Guardian argues that it writes about things that people have done, which might not be illegal, but raise political or moral or ethical questions. They're the media. Tax avoidance, for example, would be would be a good one. The Guardian says these should not be allowed to d disappear. To do so is a challenge to press freedom. The ruling has created a stopwatch on free expression. Our journalism can only be found until somebody asks for it to be hidden. Five tech giants, including Ariston Networks, Broadcom, Google, Mellanox Technologies, and Microsoft have formed a consortium to push ahead with creating specifications for both 25 gigabit internet and 50 gigabit ethernet, rather, <laughs> called the Gigabit Ethernet Consortium, which wants to create standards for both 25 gigabit ethernet and the 50 gigabit ethernet. Those are necessary in order to convert speed into systems. The level of performance is becoming more and more important to the expansion of cloud technology and to optimize data centers. The consortium was formed after plans to create official Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, specifications stalled at a meeting back last March. The consortium members now predict that technology based on these standards could hit the market within the next 12 to 18 months. 
Also back in March, the second generation of Oculus's virtual reality headset went up for pre-order for $350 with a target ship date of sometime in July. The company has now announced that the first DK2, or Developer Kit 2, headset should start arriving by the week of... July 14th, right around the corner. Oculus has received over 45,000 pre-orders for the DK2, but just 10,000 headsets are expected to ship this month. Around 12.5 thousand pre-orders came in the first 36 hours. So you can bet that some people who got their orders in, even by the second day, might not be getting their headsets for the first few weeks. Coming up after breaking a Kickstarter record, the plans LeVar Burton has for the new Reading Rainbow. And up next, I'll talk with Josh Ong about Facebook's plans after acquiring LiveRail. He's part of the next web. But first, let's take a moment to thank Smart Things for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. Smart Things makes it easy to protect and control your home, and you can do it from anywhere, iOS, Android devices. You can get started with one of the three smart home security kits that are available in the Smart Things shop. Now, each kit contains a smart things hub and sensors and outlets and can turn your home into a smart home in as little as 15 minutes it's not as hard as you think it is you just plug the smart things hub into your router you put the sensors and outlets around your house then you follow the easy video instructions in the smart things app which is free by the way you can also add hundreds of other home automation devices from a variety of manufacturers like the nest thermostat the philips hue wemo sonos and others there's a community of over 5,000 developers and growing who are creating new ways to use SmartThings, and SmartThings publishes them on their app for all the customers to use. Setting up a home security system yourself is finally easy and affordable. The home security kits start at $329, unlike the traditional home security companies. No contracts, monitoring feeds, or hidden, hidden charges at all. So to get started creating your smart home, visit smartthings.com slash twit and you can save 10% off the purchase of any home security kit by entering the code twit10 at checkout. You'll also get free shipping within the US. That's smartthings.com slash twit and remember to use the code twit10 at checkout. Joining me now is Josh Ong, reporter over at The Next Web. Hello, Josh. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Excellent. How are you doing? <laughs> well, very well, thank you. Uh, so you wrote an article called Facebook Acquires Video, Video Advertising Platform Live Rail. That sounds pretty cut and dry, but let's find out more about this platform and why Facebook would want it for themselves. Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, I mean, the ad tech stuff can get kind of boring, I think, when you start getting to, like, supply side and you know all these different kind of jargony programmatic real-time bidding terms but this is um it's a big step for facebook and it's a nice validation for live rail and i think it's part of the kind of back and forth between facebook and twitter as they evolve as um you know companies that that have really full service advertising op um opportunities and um kind of are deeply embedded in media um, both things like, you know, online video, they're both interested in things like TV um, analytics for kind of second screen stuff. So I, I think it's, um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, certainly. LiveRail Live also has some pretty high profile clients, doesn't it? Certainly. Yeah, they, um, they have like Major League Baseball, they've got ABC Family, Daily Motion, um, a few others. And, you know, um, I think... They're actually, they advertise themselves as the, the biggest kind of video ad platform out there. They claim 7 billion video ads a month that they're, um, you know, in terms of impressions. And that's a lot. I mean, we're talking billions of eyeballs. And that's really the, that's what Facebook deals in with their kind of user base. So it's, it's a good fit there. Now, Facebook introduced premium video ads back in March. Uh, I don't feel like I see many of them ever. Uh, but uh, do can we expect with uh, purchases like Live Rail that video ads will become more commonplace? We're going to have to get used to seeing more of them as the days go forward for Facebook. Yeah, I think we can um, look forward to, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, more video ads. <laughs> Yay, um, video ads. There have, been, <laughs> there have been several technological constraints that have really held it back. Things like bandwidth, um, things kind of like... Um, how to really place them and, and, and do it in a way that's really user-friendly. 
And so I think LiveRail and Facebook are both interested in combining to make video ads better. Um, and in this case, to, to really focus on the audience. And so um, publishers will, when integrated with Facebook and LiveRail, I think they'll have the opportunities to really say, look, these are the people that are watching our content or um, you know, using our apps. And I think that's going to be really valuable to advertisers. Hopefully it's valuable to us as users as well because it means more relevant ads that are uh, better targeted to us. Um, so that might sound creepy, but it, but it, it could actually get better. Um, we'll still have to deal with whether or not they're really disruptive to our experience. You know, I, I mean, like a banner ad or something, you can just kind of ignore or flip away. But video really grabs your attention, and that's part of the reason why it's so valuable, um, but also a unique problem for publishers. LiveRail well, has some big clients. Uh, do you... Do you suppose these will be nationally based ads or something that's local and depending on where you live, you might see uh, stuff that's more relevant towards you? Well, I think you'll see both. Um, you can certainly see those those national campaigns hitting on, on some of these big media properties. But I think one of the, the powerful things about this kind of ad tech is the ability to really go local. So, uh, you know, if if someone wants to do a few video ads for geo-targeted towards, you know, the people in my neighborhood because they're that kind of um, small business or something. I think there's certainly with the combination of Facebook and then a, a, an advanced video platform like, like LiveRail, uh, certainly you could see um, that level of specificity happening. And, and I think that's good. I mean, the more the algorithms and kind of the automation take over, the more it enables like smaller people to come in and and submit their bids and, and still get some uh, get some inventory instead of just like these conglomerates kind of buying up all the ads for their you know kind of national campaigns. Facebook's been experimenting with standalone apps, services that don't necessarily just become part of the Facebook experience that seem like they're their own entities. Do you see LiveRail being something that can help Facebook's uh, properties that at least? for now seem to be independent? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about those independent apps is sometimes those are more experimental where they don't have the monetization in, in place. Right. Um, and then they and Facebook can kind of lead on its core app to, to keep those ads running and fill those. And experiment with things like paper or slingshot and not necessarily have those filled up right away with like all sorts of crazy ads. Um, but I was thinking about this. I think Facebook has this, this tough dilemma where it's second to Google, I think one of the largest and most advanced ad tech companies out there. And we don't necessarily think of it as ad tech, but that's really what it is. It's collected so much data on people and their relationships and what they like, what they don't like, et cetera, that it's now able to sell that to advertisers in a way that's um, just kind of next level. Um, but on the other side, it, it's a social company. It's it's really trying to enable us to have relationships and connections. And that's kind of the idealist maybe vision that they have. Um, and those are always going to be in balance. Something like LiveRail is really going to help the ad side. Um, and it's kind of like when, you know, Google bought AdMob or Apple bought Quattro um, Wireless to create iAd. It's, it's, it's like this moment where the advertising is evolving. But at the same time, it's possible that enables the company to also spin off these kind of social experiments and in, the, in a good kind of experiment, not like a psychological one. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, these experimental <laughs> apps that have these kind of neat user experiences without necessarily being focused solely on ads. So it's, it's a back and forth, I think. Yeah. Step in the right direction for Facebook, at least. Uh, Josh Ong is the U.S. editor at The Next Web. Thanks so much for being with us, Josh, and let people know where they can keep up with what you are writing and doing on the web. Thanks. Yeah, you can hit us up at thenextweb.com. And I sit on Twitter all day, so you can come at me on um, at Beijing Do, D-O-U. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. All right, finally, remember LeVar Burton's Kickstarter campaign to bring Reading Rainbow to multiple platforms and a lot of classrooms completely for free? Well, that Kickstarter, which was very popular, closed today with funding of over $5.4 million. 
plus an additional one million that Family Guy creator Seth McFarlane plans to donate. So. A lot of money going into that. Burton's company will now be bringing Reading Rainbow to Android as well as the Xbox, PlayStation, Apple TV, and Roku. They're going to be on everything. Originally, Burton had only announced plans to bring Reading Rainbow to the web, so there's an expansion here. Reading Rainbow's campaign estimates that the web portion should be ready by next May. Now, the project didn't set a new monetary record on Kickstarter. The Pebble smartwatch still holds that crown. But it did set a new record for backers, ending with a total of over 100,000. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. I should really know that by heart by now. Don't miss our morning program, Tech News Today, which is tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.